Well, now on BBC Radio 4, Matthew Sweet unearthed the forces of the great occult revival that enveloped British pop culture in the late 60s and 70s, from dark incantations in swinging Mayfair and suburban covens to the blood-soaked furrows and sacrificial rites of the countryside. Let the ritual begin. Come, come into the circle. We're all here, me, you, the goat of Mendes. You've removed all your clothes, I assume. Oh, just me then. Ah oh, well, the ritual may still work. Let me tell you what you're about to experience. An encounter with an outré moment in the calendar of British cultural history. The time when darkness fell on the hippie dream of love and peace. A time when there was sympathy for the devil. A time to which we might now give a name. This was the dawning of the age of Black Aquarius. All right, no fooling around. This is for real. All is ready. Bring the girl. Don't you know the power of positive evil? All is according to the ritual. The Prince of Evil, the Dark One, the Horned Beast. Close the Devil's Circle. I call on Andras, Grand Marquis of Hell, provoker of discords, and upon Ronway. And did those hooves in recent times walk upon England's mountains green? Not mountains, perhaps but they went clip-clopping through swinging Mayfair. Now, wait a minute. Let's get this straight. You're talking about black mass and that sort of jazz, right? Yes, that sort of jazz. Through desanctified churches built at Pinewood Studios, through fresh ploughed fields and country villages at harvest time. Well, sir, if you will, you come from the city. You cannot know the ways of the country. And through the suburbs, too, into the living rooms of England, where darkness was invoked from the pages of the Radio Times. It's difficult to know how much genuine Satanism played a part in their practices. What, then, are we to conclude? The devil, as we know, has all the best tunes. But in these years, he had the best films, the best two-shilling paperbacks, the best plays for today and the best children's telly, too. So how should we read the runes of this story? Was the post-war British love affair with the occult just an index on our boredom or frustration, our hunger for a bit of psychedelic colour, the spiritual equivalent of buying a lava lamp? Or does it reveal something darker about the people we once were, the people we became? I just remember that my childhood was soaked in black candles, goat skulls, stray eyeballs, semi-naked women tied to things. It was a fascinating period, wasn't it? I don't know if we knew quite what we were living through. Writer and one quarter of the League of Gentlemen, Mark Gatiss. The black magic books particularly had a certain sort of terrifyingly attractive cachet. The ones I was fixated on were the... Uh, with the pan paperbacks, with covers so lurid that some of them I didn't dare look at. In the late 60s, Mark, there was much talk of the Age of Aquarius. At the end of the 60s, the Age of Aquarius seemed to be darker. Dark forces that are very historically specific. Forces that we do not forces yet understand. Forces that we cannot understand. <laughs> forces that we may never understand. Well, there's a run of it, isn't there? That's the thing. I mean, you, I would say... It's sort of the flip side of the 60s anyway, but it's certainly by the early 70s that it gets traction and then becomes absolutely everywhere. At the end of the 1960s, you didn't have to be dropping acid with Timothy Leary to believe that Western culture was on the edge of something. The idea that it would soon all be over for the Enlightenment was the informing suspicion of Kenneth Clark's great television series, Civilization which ended with Ken standing in the library of his own castle, quoting a Yeats poem steeped in doomy occult imagery. Things fall apart. The centre cannot hold. 
Mere anarchy is loosed upon the world. The blood-dimmed tide is loosed, and everywhere the ceremony of innocence is drowned. But if civilization was in danger of falling, what would follow? Plenty thought they knew the answer to that. A new world shaped by a younger generation whose ideas were formed not just by Mao and Marx, but by a culture of mysticism. There was a pendulum swing away from the 1950s or the 1940s and the visions of rationality and technology and progress. And what's at the end of that is the mystic, you know, the pagan, the occult. Cult historian and writer Kim Newman. There's a strand of British occultism and mysticism that runs deep. Look up the Agapemone in Charlinch in Somerset, or the Rector of Stiffkey, or all the Theosophists. The rediscovery of these freaks of the past. We had this wedding of you know, occult mysticism with British eccentricity. The occult was caught up in this sort of 60s revolutionary fervor, and it was one more element in that. And it threatened in the same sort of way that the kind of sexual revolution or the drug revolution did. In some way upset the accepted order of things. This is the Aquarius. The age of Aquarius is based on an actual astronomical fact, something called the precession of the equinoxes. Gary Lackman was the bassist in Blondie and now writes on the occult. The new age is supposed to be happening, and it all depends on which astrologer you, you know, take your readings from. It's not very accurate. It's in the general degree of a century or two. And what is supposed to happen is kind of the return of the golden age. Aquarians are here, there, and everywhere. There was this tremendous explosion of this Aquarian ideal, which perhaps had a darker side. The psychedelic aesthetics of the period were very much shaped by people taking LSD, of course, people smoking a lot of dope. As long as they are free and be able to do their thing. And there was this whole new interest in the irrational. People reading Hermann Hesse, casting the I Ching, they were reading the Tibetan Book of the Dead. And it went with a whole aura of joss sticks, astrology, tarot cards, the whole business, a kind of occult explosion. Travel on. Occult historian Phil Baker. Well, a lot of young people don't believe there is a power when they get involved in, in satanic or black magic practices. They go for the drugs, they go for the fun of it, they go for the adventure, uh, and really um, will resort to their own ruination. But once you're in, you sold your soul. These uh, kind of atavistic forces that were being released, beyond good and evil, you know, do without wilt. Whatever the astrological correspondence is, culturally and sociologically at the time, all of that kind of total liberation ethos seemed to explode into something negative, something dark. But for years, it seems, there had been a growing constituency willing this explosion to happen. You would have felt that vibe in British cinemas of the early 60s. Smoke-filled and slightly damp British cinemas, I like to think, where a new kind of documentary was giving filmgoers the chance to gaze upon a world more free, more weird and more dirty than the one they lived in. It was what drove exploitation cinema, commercial films about the occult that could also make money and attract an audience. Nigel Wingrove is founder of the occult horror film company, Redemption Films. This is a black mass in which the place, form and vestments of a Christian mass are used. Legend of the Witches is a kind of early fly on the wall type documentary. It's very black and white, very dark. Filming and interviewing people on the occult scene in the UK, it's a classic piece of exploitation cinema, really. Michael! It begins with a Michael. chap called Michael being chased through the countryside Michael. because he's going to be initiated and become a witch himself. It was very voyeuristic, but at the same time, there was an interest in it. And of course, the more people went to see those films, the more people got interested in the occult, and so it went on, didn't it? Away from the circle, the initiate, blindfolded, is prepared for the ordeals which he must undergo before becoming a witch. 
the documentary film Legend of the Witches, written and directed by Malcolm Lee. But cinema is not the source of the 1960s occult revival. That's to be found in a series of older texts, texts possessed of a monstrous power, despite the cheap acidic paper that bore their words. Works by Dennis Wheatley, who, between the age of Stanley Baldwin and the age of Sid Vicious, wrote night black paperbacks with titles such as Gateway to Hell, They Used Dark Forces, The Devil Rides Out, and To the Devil a Daughter. Books not for adepts, but for the snobbish, aspirational, and blood randy English middle classes of the mid 20th century. Wheatley was fantastically popular in the 1960s and 70s. I remember if you went into a branch of somewhere like W.H. Smith's, there'd be almost a whole wall of Wheatley's banked up. And although he'd been quite popular in the 30s and 40s, he then went a little bit out of fashion and he just came back again, mainly for the occult books. Dennis Wheatley's biographer, Phil Baker. To a great extent, Wheatley sort of invented the public image of black magic and Satanism. And the weird thing is, although it was meant to be terribly evil, he made it seem strangely seductive and luxurious. It's all about pentagrams and magic circles on the floor of country house libraries. How clever of you to carry out your scheme of decoration on the floor as well. The Duke was thoughtfully regarding a five-pointed star enclosed within two circles, between which numerous mystic characters in Greek and Hebrew had been carefully drawn. The Satanists, they tend to be a sort of circle of international degenerates, and they're always great connoisseurs of things like Chinese ivory or imperial jade. Almost like the thing you get in the James Bond books, which again are very much about consumerism. It's all about food and drink. Food and drink are always very, very itemised in Wheatley's books. And there's lobster, caviar, verve, clico, foie gras. And that actually hit some sort of spot in the 60s when people were getting quite excited about the idea of things like groovy antique dealers and swinging aristocrats. You've always been pretty careful to warn people against dabbling in black magic. Yeah. But uh, for all that you warn people against uh, black magic, you've made a pretty good thing of it yourself, writing about it in the way you promoted it. Yes, undoubtedly. I'm sure the books have paid off very well. But I've never in my life attended any sort of magical ceremony. I've never even attended a seance. And I think it's a bad thing. I'm all against it. In his 1971 non-fiction book, The Devil and All His Works, Dennis Wheatley had a stern warning for the love generation. Human behaviour, he said, has entered a new phase. It is termed the permissive society. The restraining powers of the church, parental authority and public opinion have been overthrown by the younger generation. It is this that has brought about this great upsurge in the practice of magic. These young people who have become initiates are liable to become pawns of the powers of darkness. Doreen Valiente is a witch, and she believes that witchcraft should never be approached lightly. The amount of silly dabbling in the occult that goes on today scares me. These people think that they're doing something terribly clever and terribly with it, and it's all great fun. And what they don't understand is that they're invoking forces which they can't fathom, and they're making themselves a channel by which those forces can come through into the world. The Power of the Witch was a rather unusual documentary, shown just once on BBC television in December 1971. We believe in the horned god and in the goddess of the moon. And in a wood at midnight, on the night of the full moon, Doreen Valiente carried out her ritual hoping that in this experiment, never before tried in front of cameras, some psychic manifestations might appear on the film. Presented by Michael Bakewell, it was the fullest investigation of occult practice in Britain to date, talking to witches, psychics, cultists and dabblers of all kinds. It's now a cult artefact in its own right. Are there really dangers involved, or is it all just a delusion? And if it is just a delusion, why do so many really quite intelligent people half believe in it? Just what has been going on in this country since the last of the witchcraft laws was repealed in 1951? The wind is crying through the trees, and we invoke thee to appear. Did you ever try and raise the devil? I did raise the devil. 
and I'm paying the price for it now. Uh, I made a sort of pact. <laughs> it's worked out. But I'm I know the small print here. I, I, know, <laughs> I know they'll they'll come a reckoning. Um, no, no, I was I was genuinely uh, I was very frightened of of such things as a child. I could cope with vampires and werewolves and the mummy, but the devil, the devil seemed very real to me. Was the devil a figure who came to you through popular culture or through religious oh, culture? Oh, where yeah. did he, where did oh, he live? Definitely pop culture. I mean, nothing to do with my religious upbringing it was the devil didn't figure in that at all. So it was totally through stories and, and films. Dennis Wheatley began writing fiction in 1933, the same year that Roundtree launched these, Black Magic, one of the first chocolate box products to be sold at a mass market price. For less than three shillings, you could be initiated into the mysteries of those little piped hieroglyphs and know the nut cluster and the cherry cream and their secret signs alone. Caramel. Both, in their own way, offered to connect the mid-century consumer with older, more privileged pleasures. A late Victorian and Edwardian decadence that encompassed the idea of occult knowledge. Wheatley had a strong connection with one of the great powers of this world, Alistair Crowley, a libertine from Leamington Spa who spelt magic with a K, preached, there is no law beyond do what thou wilt. And in the 1890s was a member of the Hermetic Order of the Golden Dawn, a mystic outfit that had WB Yeats on its subs list. To kids growing up in austerity Britain, the generation who would go on to found the British counterculture, Crowley had all the makings of a pinup. Yourself. That's the easiest thing to do. I went for tea and biscuits with Tim Dark Smith, Do you have milk? Crowley scholar and former acolyte of the Golden Dawn. I'm putting it afterwards to show that I know this is good china. At what point did Crowley come back into focus, as it were? Well, I suppose it was taking place when the Beatles put him on the cover of Sergeant Pepper. They wouldn't just have put him there unless they got wind of it somehow. The Rolling Stones went down to see a disciple of Crowley's. He was a man called Gerald York. Gerald owned an enormous house in Gloucestershire. And I said, Gerald, uh, what did you do uh, when the Stones rang up and said, we're on the way? He said, I told the servants to make cakes. <laughs> Uh, any, <laughs> any particular kind of cake. And of course the one person who really knew what he was doing in that world was Jimmy Page of Led Zeppelin. He bought Alistair Crowley's Scottish house by the shores of Loch Ness. And then of course you've got to remember the drugs and you've got to remember the sex. Banging the table for emphasis <laughs> on the word sex. It obsessed him, and he made it part of his magical beliefs. So Crowley is the person who's responsible for importing that kind of sexualized atmosphere to ritual practice. Um, he, in a way, is, is packaging this stuff, and somehow his perfect audience turn up in the 60s. Exactly. He would have been a rich man if he'd lived. Highgate Cemetery, officially opened in 1839, was once described as the most beautiful resting place in London. In the last few years, vandals stalking around the overgrown tombs have done over 9,000 pounds worth of damage. Statues have been swept from their pedestals and coffins disrupted and desecrated. This is the East Cemetery at Highgate in North London. The sun's coming down now. I feel very much alive, so does David Farrant, who's with me here, and knows this place rather better than me, because something significant happened to you here. One night, it was the 21st of December, 1969, which was the winter solstice. As I passed the north gate of Highgate Cemetery, that's the top gate, I became aware of somebody standing just inside the closed gate. 
they were standing motionless, exuding some sort of malignancy, some sort of evil. And within a matter of only seconds, I realised it was not a human being. What was it that made you think that you weren't looking at a human figure? Well, for one thing, it had no discernible features. And more than that, I witnessed two points of light, which I took to be its eyes. Within a matter of seconds, I felt it was draining me of energy. It's very difficult to describe. I wasn't expecting it. At the cemetery, Farrant was forced to enter by the back wall, as he still does today. What do you remember about the media interest in this? Because there were camera crews down here, weren't there? A team from the BBC's 24 Hours programme. He armed himself with a cross and stake and crouched between the tombstones waiting. Well, there was a lot of interest in it and they wanted to interview myself, which they did. We have been keeping watch in the cemetery and we have still found the signs of their ceremonies here. Have you ever seen this vampire? I have seen it, yes. I saw it last February and I saw it on two occasions. What was it like? It took the form of a tall grey figure and it about eight feet tall and it seemed to glide. One thing that interested the media is that there was a lot of satanic activity going on in Highgate Cemetery. When you say satanic activity what do you mean? I mean a dedicated group of people who were practicing black magic and I actually found the remains of their symbols it was a mausoleum just through that path and behind the trees. This desecration was utterly different to anything that had happened before in Highgate Cemetery. This time there was no lead missing from the coffin and there were pentacles and other Satanist symbols chalked here on the walls. And around the edges of this pentagram there was the sign of Mars, Saturn and the moon. That's the black moon. And in that combination, those signs are very, very potent. The owners of Highgate Cemetery, United Cemeteries Limited, regard freelance vampire hunters like Farrant as a thoroughgoing nuisance. In all their years, no gravedigger here has ever seen a winged creature or a black magic circle. But so long as bodies are violated and pentacles chalked on walls, the cauldron of the occult will continue to bubble. From the BBC's Current Affairs series, 24 Hours, October 1970. Is there a relationship between popular Satanism and permissiveness? Popular Satanism, that was a magazine at the time, <laughs> along with Woodworking Today. I, remember I used to subscribe to it. Both best read in the shed, I think. <laughs> it was a part work. But I think it is all, it's all wrapped up, isn't it? Because the, the obvious rejoinder of having the Lord Chamberlain abolished and, and suddenly film censorship changing so much was is knockers, as we know, and they then became totally ubiquitous in horror movies. And the the best way of having bare breasts is a satanic orgy. Rules then rapidly rushed into place which were completely immutable. Purple robes, always, a large amount of liquor being consumed, usually quite pale uh, Ribena-like wine, um, some sort of voodoo rhythm, probably from a, a bought-in house band. Mark, I want to proffer you a, an ancient text, or I think it's quite ancient, it's, it's rather dog-eared and yellowed, mm. um, and it's from Aren't the early 70s. <laughs> it's by Sandra Shulman, it's called The Degenerates, and she takes us into a black mass, of the sort you're describing, really. I shall read this. It was a sick scene. Knocking him unconscious and tying him up was taking the game too far. His wrists were numb, his head ached, and the need to relieve himself urgently increasing. In the thickening shadows, the other players entered. Sheldon could give no burst of derisive laughter. There was nothing funny about these jokers. His eyes had long since learned to see all that was going on, even with a blinding headache. But their robes, masks and garters, he knew them a cross-section of the darlings of London society. Ten of the twelve had attended the Deepwater Party. The eleventh was a dwarf. Well known round Dockland pubs and offbeat Soho drinking joints. A wino who touted for anything going. When there was nothing, he let out his rear to those with devious tastes. <laughs> <laughs> Fantastic. <laughs> Now, oh, wow. What? Read the minds of the people who bought a book like this. Does this represent something about the 
the frustrations of being in a country where supposedly the permissive society has us in its grip, but really it's not happening for, for it anybody. Do. It must do. You know, again, you go back to Bond, there's a strange sort of parallels, I think, that the desire for escapism, the desire to get on that BOAC jet to Jamaica with Bond, it's the same sort of feeling of like, oh, I could be doing this. And you know, when I get that train home, I'm going to get the 525 from Waterloo, perhaps a mysterious foreign lady who doesn't speak will beckon me into a corner and I, I'll get invited to one of these things and perhaps someone will let out their rear to me or something like that. <laughs> but it says, you know, on the back, the sensational novel that exposes the evil of Satanism in Britain today. But like all these things in a very sort of news of the world way, it's actually an invitation, isn't it? An invitation, but to what kind of party exactly? A clue to what card-carrying Satanists were up to in the 1960s can be found in a Hammer film from the early 1970s, Dracula AD 1972. The Count is back, said the poster, with an eye for London's hot pants and a taste for everything. Alan Gibson's horror picture introduces us to a bunch of putative satanic dabblers who meet in a Chelsea coffee bar called The Cavern. Well, the new experiences, the new happenings, Ed. OK, Johnny, where? Something new, yet as old as time, I wonder. <laughs> Caroline Monroe played the swinging sacrificial victim, Laura Bellows. We shot it in the early 70s, but the dialogue, the clothes, the whole idea, the way it was shot, everything was kind of late 60s based, so it sort of fitted really well. Ready for what? What are you talking about? Something way, way out. So we had this kind of strange dialogue. That black magic jazz. Yes, that sort of jazz. That's it. I think that was one of the lines. Oh, I remember one of mine. Oh, it sounds wild. Hey, but it sounds wild. <laughs> Sunday supplement stuff. I don't know if it was too well received at the time. A date with the devil. A bacchanal with Beelzebub. OK, OK, but if we do get to summon up the big daddy with the horns and the tail, he gets to bring his own liquor, his own bird and his own pot. <laughs> In this film, the occult, Satanism, whatever it is they're into exactly, is presented as something that's fashionable, that's something that young people are curious about. Definitely, you know, we did it, we were acting, we were playing the part of these young, carefree teenagers, looking for fun, looking for excitement. I think it was the excitement of the unknown. To Balfour Place in London, in Mayfair, on the blue bit of the Monopoly board, it's extremely grand and respectable now. The Qatari ambassador lives across the street and the house itself now is banked with very neatly manicured ivy and cyclamen flowers. But something really very peculiar was going on here. In the 60s, this was the HQ of the process, London's hippest, smartest satanic cult. It was led by a charismatic couple called Robert and Mary de Grimston. Around the back of this building, they had a printing press with which they used to produce a rather stylish magazine. They would dress head to toe in black capes. They wore pentangle pendants. They worked here, they communed with dark forces here. And down in the basement, they ran a cafe called Satan's Cavern, where you could get corn on the cob and contemplate the way of Lucifer. Round here, in this very affluent part of London, this was really where, where the occult was happening in this period. Dennis Wheatley gave his anti-satanic hero, the Duke de Richelieu, an address just round the corner here on Curzon Street. And the Temple of the Hermetic Order of the Golden Dawn is a little further away on St James's. I think it was one of the motives that took me to visiting the headquarters of Process in Mayfair. The girls were rather pretty and they looked rather glam in these long black cloaks and they were rather posh. The novelist Robert Irwin found himself irresistibly drawn to the process. There were all these fascinating people floating and out, all young, all very neatly trimmed beards, long golden hair. And there were a lot of advertisements for the three ways of life. You could follow the way of Jehovah, you could follow the way of Lucifer, or you could, if I remember rightly, follow the way of Satan. Now, when you went in and you saw those things upon the wall, did you know in a way what you were in for? 
No, but I, see, I didn't know what I was in for, but I soon found out. I, I started attending groups where you sort of meditated and, well, for instance, you'd stare into somebody's eyes for the whole of an hour, or you'd try and guess what their aura was. They wanted to break down the old grey conventionality, terrible drive in the 60s not to be ordinary. The subject of the Black Mass, I feel, mm. is going to rear its head quite yeah. soon. How did you come to be at such an event? It wasn't sort of super secret. There was no meeting on a dark heath or anything. Um, it was in part based on what they'd read of Alistair Crowley and the rituals that Alistair Crowley spelt out. I also think it owed a fair bit to Hammer horror films. Anyway, you need a desanctified church, don't you? St Bartolts. It's a church due for demolition about a mile from here down on the embankment. So why did we give it a whirl? Caroline Monroe. They found a deconsecrated church. We managed to break in. You made it. Christopher Neen, Johnny, Johnny Avogad, gives us shrouds to put on, the ladies' black shrouds. Very low cut black shrouds, I seem to remember. And then he gives us something to smoke and turns the music on, which was playing throughout. All right, no fooling around. This is for real. Close the devil's circle. So it starts. Take the music, kids. A black mass. A black mass. Robert Irwin. Dear diary, I attended my first black mass this evening. This is the scene in my memoir, uh, Memoirs of a Dervish, about attending a black mass at the process headquarters in Mayfair. A lot of Crowley's terrible poetry was read out early on. We sat around the stairwell looking down on what was enacted below. The main part of the ritual was like something out of the film version of Dennis Wheatley's The Devil Rides Out, and it was aesthetically rather pleasing, as it framed black and gold robes, a dark vessel containing a mysterious black potion, a silver mirror, black candles, and the Book of the Law. I'm holding like a chalice, a silver chalice, I seem to remember, and I'm lying down in my shroud with this chalice, and then the blood seems to flow from him into whatever was in the chalice. Now you got it together, that. The robed celebrants were the deacon, the priest, the virgin priestess, and two long-haired acolytes. The priestess wore white, the men black. My character, aptly named Laura Bellows. Because uh, you're fanning the flames of Satanism. Mm, uh, well, I'm, I'm just excited. I'm a young, impressionable girl. No. It's going to be me. It has to be me. Me, Johnny, me. I'll do it. Me. Not knowing what I am the one for, but I am the one. The high point was when the priestess was stripped down to her underwear and made to lie spread-eagled on the altar where she was kissed all over by the priest. There were no dark manifestations and I heard someone mutter that the priestess was not really a virgin. It was not Satanism, but merely theatre. Did you have a sense, Caroline, as you were filming that scene, that something peculiar could possibly have happened or be happening? I actually, very, strangely enough, very much did insofar as when we were doing the scene. Now, don't forget, we were in a, a sound stage, a very secure sound stage within the church. So all the doors were closed. Everything was closed and locked down. And you had these big black curtains way up above. And then suddenly, for some reason or for reasons unknown, they did just start to sway. You know, nothing at that point was moving around you know there's nothing and then it started to sway so that was a very strange and i remember you know the crew we were all kind of looking around it was it was a strange moment let's say <laughs> if it's going to happen anywhere it's going to happen yeah, there isn't yeah. it yeah he did an amazing job in dracula ad 1972 one of caroline monroe's hipster friends dismisses devil worship as sunday supplement stuff and the archive seems full of the struggle over how seriously to take such stories. The same debate that would be pursued much more gravely during the satanic abuse scare of the 1980s, in which the tropes of popular 70s treatments of the occult seemed to be reproduced in conversations in the therapy room and had a painful impact on the real lives of a number of British families. Heartwork magazines and the news of the world could afford to lark about with this, 
But what about serious broadcasters from ITV and the BBC who wanted to say something about what, if anything, was actually happening? It could be any street in any suburb of any city in the country. The children are at school, the men at work, their wives settling down to a quiet afternoon at home. On the surface, a perfectly normal Thursday afternoon in the middle of winter, but not behind the doors of number 25. Exorcise from you all tools of evil. In the name of God. Helen! In Man Alive, in Horizon documentaries on the occult, in accounts of the case of the Highgate vampire, there's an uncertainty about the phenomena under discussion. Not really an ontological uncertainty about whether or not these things are real, but doubt about how to read them. Is it the job of a theologian, a sociologist, a mental pathologist? For every interview with a bearded believer, filmmakers cut back to a man in a suit with letters after his name. I talked to the most intelligent people, and they say, but uh, Dr. Sargent, you have not experienced this. If you had, you would believe, and I think they're right. Let all witchcraft, sorcerer, and black magic fly from hence. The church, as well as the BBC, felt compelled to respond. Some priests were more enthusiastic than others. And I exercise the every unclean spirit and the man alive crew was also quick on the scene when in 1972 the bishop of exeter published a report on exorcism you are critical of the church of england and the bishop of exeter's the, the services are, on exorcism are almost complete nonsense they just don't work Giles Fraser is priest in charge at St Mary's Newington in south london and the former canon chancellor of st paul's cathedral I mean, I suppose if your emotional and existential bandwidth has been narrowed so much by the values of your society, that all sorts of things you can't say, all sorts of things you're not allowed to do, then suddenly metaphysical permissiveness, as it were, has an attraction, but in a sort of cheap way, because obviously these people are still you know, deeply entrenched in their values. So they dabble. That's why they dabble. I pray. I pray to the devil. And part of me was sort of... I was frightened, but I would continue and I'd pray to the devil and say, take my soul, give me all the things that I want. Give me a white Rolls Royce, a black windows and a TV aerial on top. Give me all the wealth I want, give me all the girls I want to go to bed with. And then it suddenly dawned on me, what am I doing? Activity like this presents a kind of puzzle for the church. How seriously should it be taken? Is it a game? If it is a game, it's a game in which people are talking about, at least, the idea of evil it's not necessarily just that kind of melodramatic uh, yeah, yeah. evil yeah, yeah. which yeah, is yeah, talked yeah, about a lot yeah, in this yeah, yeah. actual yeah. evil is well, being discussed at the very least those parts of the church that have a much sharper sense of metaphysical evil so sort of evangelicals who were actually much less prominent then than they are now they were quite exercised. But this is a very interesting phenomenon because actually the established church was also exercised back then. It was somehow deemed to be corrupting of people's morals. Now, so far, we've considered the occult as a sophisticated practice, Satanism and magic as connoisseurial activities pursued by an in-crowd, like knowing about French wine or when to use a fish knife. But there's another way of looking at this, one that also has its roots in the 19th century. As Britain's population reoriented itself towards the industrial cities, the Victorians became nostalgic for those vanished cunning men and wise women who seemed to have been more populous before the age of the factory and the threshing machine. This feeling too found a new home in the late 1960s with a cultural turn that you'll also see reflected in Laura Ashley, in the self-sufficiency movement and in the triumph of Muesli. But sentimental pastoralism had its flip side. The country is a place where you can escape the stress of urban life, but it's also an alien environment, a place where city dwellers don't know how to conduct themselves, a place where no one can hear you scream.
curator and founder of Trunk Records, Johnny Trunk. The occult was moving from, because of films like Far of the Manning Crowd, where they were sort of beautiful cinematic explorations of life and death in the countryside, the occult soon went, OK, we don't need to be in the city. We don't need to be in Chelsea with the swingers. We can be out in the countryside with the occult swingers too. And this also was happening on the TV. There's an infamous play for today from BBC in 1970 called Robin Redbreast, where um, it's probably easy if I read the synopsis out because it, it sort of sums it up so well. So after the breakup of a long-term relationship, urban sophisticate Nora seeks refuge in a remote house in the country. The locals are friendly, if eccentric, and she toys with the idea of a flirtation with a dishy young gamekeeper, Rob. But events at Harvest Festival leave her feeling manipulated, and six months later, with the consequences all too evident, she finds herself trapped in what is more like a nightmare. That's right, Mrs Gibbons said you had trouble at the post office. Helen Wheatley writes on television and the Gothic. Slowly, it's revealed that she's being watched, that she's being monitored. Does it seem odd to you, Mrs Vigo, that for five days I have been trying without any success to get away from here? And I've begun to feel trapped and decidedly nervous. Villagers who seem on the surface to be common everyday folk turn out to be something far more ancient and far more sinister. Really, Mrs Vigo, when I asked you to bring me a chicken, I didn't mean you to kill one specially. Oh, she and broody, no use for laying, wring her neck, slit her throat, hang her up, that's all she can good for. The manipulation of the new arrival in yeah. the village is a trope that exists across film and television programmes in this period. The protagonists extracting themselves from these ancient rites, rituals or characters and getting back to modernity. In the case of Robin Redbreast, that inevitably means trying to get out of the village but finding that her phone line is cut. Anyway, what I was wondering, Jake, my dear, if you and Mad would like a day in the country on Sunday. I said if you and Mad would like a day in the country on Sunday. What? I can't hear. He hello? Hello, Nora? Hello. Hello, hello, exchange. Hello. Robin Redbreast, written by John Bowen for the BBC's Play for Today in 1970, starring Anna Cropper as the village's new arrival, Nora Palmer. I've heard of things. Every now and then there's a song and dance about it in the Sunday papers. Devil worship, graves dug up, churches desecrated, blood, stories of blood, always rather vague. I never believed it happened seriously. You're being funny. Why are you keeping me here, all You're of you? You're being funny. I don't understand. Yes, I'm being funny. In the American cinema, we know what the countryside is like because it's the Texas Chainsaw Massacre and Deliverance. But the British version of that is, you know, moving to a village and finding out that the Women's Institute are really a satanic coven. And at the end, there's going to be some horrible sacrifice to renew the crops. Cult historian and writer Kim Newman. The small town that is outwardly charming and lovable but is inwardly evil is something we find over and over and over in British fiction. The tension in these dramas is a tension around free will, the occult and the control of free will. Characters at the centre of so many of these dramas try to hold on to their ability to make decisions and yet the occult is all about having decisions made for you. In Robin Redbreast, the central protagonist thinks she's chosen this new life in a new house, in a new village, but actually it has chosen her. And you have the sense that your local worthies, you know, the hierarchy, I suppose it comes, even the League of Gentlemen sort of do this. The idea that your local doctor will also be your local high priest or your local squire will put on the robes and cut the heads off goats. All of these things bubble away inside your work. Mm. Uh, there should be a squire, I would say. There'll be a, a newcomer to the village, possibly a pregnant woman in a Laura Ashley frock. Uh, I would say a lame boy or a dumb boy, certainly someone with some kind of physical impairment who usually dresses up in motley. Um, a harvest festival? I guess, definitely a harvest festival. A maypole? Probably. I mean, that's very wicked, man. But there's a lot of it around, isn't there? An unreliable postmistress. <laughs> yes. <laughs>
Um, uh, well, prob and I would say, yes, I'm just, you know, going with this, but probably uh, a reliable London friend who turns out to be at the heart of the conspiracy, Ian Cuthbertson. Um, what else? Well, uh, you know, a, a, a full on black mass with lots of non-speaking extras in purple robes, the wine, the goblets, uh, some kind of stone circle. I'd watch that film. You've made it, haven't you? <laughs> Mark Gatiss. Whoa! Blood on Satan's claw. What a strange, dark, poetic enterprise. In this picture, the land literally contains evil. It's there, in rotten nuggets in the topsoil, ready to be turned by the plough, ready to awaken. Piers Haggard was the director who unearthed it. A strange, deformed, furry face with a horrible eye. The plowman digs this up and then something is liberated into the community, both psychologically and physically. What does it add to take this story to this location, to find your evil in the soil? The answer lies in the soil, as they used to say. I shot the whole film with a lot of very, very low angles. And there are lots of camera positions which are in the earth, camera on the ground or slightly below, just to keep suggesting that who knows what might be going to come up. Holy bear moth, father of my life, speak now, come now. Rise now from the forest, from the furrows, from the fields and live. As the film comes to its climax, the children who have taken over the village and killed people, in this ruined church, they have developed a series of rites. And they are trying to conjure the complete devil, whose parts only we have sort of seen. And a, a drumming and, and a chanting. A bonfire in the church and the smoke and the, out of the smoke shall come the devil himself. This kind of occultism tapped into something that felt like it was deep in the British cultural memory, even if it was, I suspect, really a fairly recent idea. The idea of ancient horrors that somewhere in a secluded village might be quietly maintained by tight-lipped locals, places where the Enlightenment wasn't just fragile, it had never happened. A terrifying idea, terrifying enough for 1970s children's telly. They explored it quietly in The Owl Service, the ITV adaptation of Alan Garner's novel, full of teenage sexual angst and the Mabinogion. Was my blood, was my body. And on BBC One, in Doctor Who, they did it with colour separation overlay, scarlet robes and Roger Delgado giving a black mass that's actually Mary Had a Little Lamb, read backwards. He go away! I will speak with you. Show yourself. In the 1972 story, The Demons, Satan walked to the English countryside, much to the surprise of John Pertwee's Doctor Who and Katie Manning's Joe Grant. But it really is the dawning of the age of Aquarius. So? Well, that means the occult. Well, you know, the supernatural and all that magic bits. You know, really, Joe. I'm obviously wasting my time trying to turn you into a scientist. You have to go onto the edge of danger or you're never going to get great. You're just always going to get like a nice, you know, flat line. Katie Manning. All the people who said, but if you have a church exploding and you have devils and Doctor Who and, 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 and all this kind of, it's terrible, it's wrong, it's evil. You know, that was going on about this. This nearly didn't go out. Um, but but did the, the congregation and the vicar at the church you filmed in, did they know that you were then going back to the studio to film a satanic ritual? I don't think so, darling. Were there any problems for the BBC in holding what is in effect a black mass in Studio 2 at Television Centre? You've obviously were too young to be around there then, weren't you, darling? I would say that it was a very welcome party. <laughs> <laughs> 
accept this offering as a token of our fealty. What do you recall about the experience of being sacrificed? Do you remember how you felt in that moment, then? How I felt in that moment? It's hard to say, but I was actually in that moment with the belief, with my eyes scrunched tight, that this was the end. The end? Of my life. You mean you thought... Wow. Oh, no. I go there. No, he's a good man. Kill me, not him. Especially if you're doing a program like Doctor Who. If you don't have that strength of belief, then truth will not go out to those watching you. And that's something one takes very seriously. A decade before Katie made the ultimate sacrifice, satanic subjects required an ex-certificate. By 1972, they'd been domesticated by tea-time television. Friends of the Goat of Mendes were free to gather in the suburban living room. The typical 70s press or TV story about the occult doesn't unfold in a magical temple in Mayfair. It takes place among the Draylon and the Anaglypta. This is where witchcraft flourished. To the uninitiated, it must all seem very strange, but one can't help feeling that at the end of a long day in the office, it must be a blessed relief to get into something loose and relax among friends. More often than not, in the lounge of Alex Sanders, the self-crowned King of the Witches, who talked endlessly to reporters about the dark side. I did a magic ritual in reverse, and within a year, I owned a 26-roomed house. Within five years, I'd gone through nearly three quarters of a million pounds by the use of black magic. He's forgotten now, but he was everywhere in the occult documentary of this period. He even found his way into the flaming pit of the album charts. Johnny Trunk. Alexander's was known as King of the Witches and was almost like the popular face of witchcraft in the UK. He wrote lots of books, appeared in documentaries, made a record for A&M, the label that put out things like Sergio Mendes in Brazil 66 and <laughs> Spanish Flea. <laughs> and then all of a sudden, in about 1971, this album comes out called A Witch is Born. Wherefore I do bless thee and consecrate thee by the powerful and potent name of Carnena and Aradia. Between the northern and eastern candles and just outside the circle stands the initiate who is waiting to be admitted. She is naked and blind for I think it sort of slipped through the net. It came out with a big sticker on the side saying that the record was suitable for adults only and that the sticker sort of glued up the gatefold because in the gatefold there's multiple pictures of young witches and older witches all naked. <laughs> and so the LP was immediately banned. Inside the circle, the high priest, the high priestess and the rest of the coven are naked or robed as each individual wishes on this particular... The railway bookstands of Britain were black with paperbacks, with covers depicting hooded acolytes and candle-clutching witchy nudes. Alan Bryce edits the occult magazine The Dark Side. The whole occult business was a great inspiration to the soft porn industry. There are only a limited amount of plots you can have anyway. And I think they realised that they could use this as a jumping off point for a number of exploitation bases. You don't believe in witches? The results were very lurid. You'd better believe in the virgin witch. She'll blow your mind. Ah. Virgin Witch, from the typewriter of Hazel Adair, co-creator of Crossroads. In a circle of sin, a demon lover initiates the Virgin Witch. You think she's untouched? Virgins are hard to come by, as you very well know, Gerald. I can recognize power. She wants to be a witch. Because the occult is all about rituals, a lot of the adult industry in those days were going into things like wife swapping and the kind of things that were in the Sunday papers at the time. And the news of the world, I remember, it's just full of stories about 
witchcraft covens and strange sort of sex rituals, which were vaguely hinted at as maybe having an occult basis. <laughs> ah, beyond the flames, beyond Alistair Crowley and the hermetic order of the Golden Dawn, lies this, the devil-worshipping, wife-swapping nexus. The realisation that the coming satanic order or the return of the old gods of fertility and chaos might be as subject to the shifts of fashion as the length of a sideburn or the width of a tie. And maybe something bigger was happening in the culture too. The radicalism of the 60s and 70s had given space to the Baroque, the Cavalier, but the radicalism of the coming decade would take colder forms and nobody would be in the mood for a fancy dress blood orgy. Evil didn't disappear, nor, I suppose, did its attractions, but the occult, the devil and all his works, seemed suddenly as quaint as flower power. Where did it go? It's never gone away, Matthew. Um, well, I suppose it's fashion, isn't it? And uh, it, like, like all these things, it, what started as terrifying became sort of burlesqued and other things took over. But I don't remember the last time the devil is turned up um, as an actual presence. That doesn't really seem to be around at the moment. Do I think this is just what he wants? Well, quite. Although he probably enjoyed the popularity of the 60s and 70s, it's like putting all your wares in the front of the shop. Is there a difference between evil and evil? <laughs> oh, yes. <laughs> what, where does it lie? I think in the toast. <laughs> I think, you know, you could describe someone as, as spiritually evil, but if you raise a goblet full of Ribena, and it's definitely evil. Cheers. <laughs> Black Aquarius was presented by Matthew Sweet and was produced by Simon Hollis. It was a Brook Lapping production for BBC Radio 4.